Yes. Well, um, good news for me is that uh, according to our COVID committee, who's done an awesome job uh, this year helping protect us and put into play policies that respected the reality of a pandemic, um, they did give me the green light to take the mask off for preaching. So, <laughs> amen to that. I want to read to you one of the Palm um, story texts. I'm going to read to you out of uh, John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 12 through 20, um, reminding you that John's Gospel is the last writing in the New Testament, probably. Um, uh, John, Revelation, one of those two. Um, and it's the, in my opinion, it's the most fully developed gospel. And there's something unique in John's gospel of Palm Sunday that I think is significant that's not found in the other gospels. So let me read to you verses 12 through 20. Uh, the next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. That's a repeated refrain in the gospels you know they just don't quite get it yet right uh, but when jesus was glorified then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him so the crowd that had been with him when he called lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify it was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went out to meet him the Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the whole world has gone to him. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And that's an interesting little phrase, isn't it? <laughs> no, there were some Greeks there. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. But I just want to begin by, uh, uh, as you look at my notes on the wall, uh, just to remind you that uh, Palm Sunday is orchestrated theater. This is not an event that just happened to have happened, but this is something that Jesus deliberately put into play. And you can read Mark, Luke, Matthew, and you can find the details of that in ways that John does not describe. Um, but I just want you to know that, that this, is, this is street theater. This is counter protest is really what it is. And we've lived this past year with many street theater events. Uh, Palm Sunday is street theater event. And one of the things that you'll see on my slide there are these two narrative pictures. One is a Black Lives Matter peaceful march. And one is a reenactment march of Roman centurions on that bottom. Now, what, what is interesting is that historians tell us that Jesus and his entourage and his nonviolent parade of peasants who are coming to Jerusalem would have come in from the Mount of Olives through Bethany, which is coming in from the east. Now, during Passover, which is the setting of Holy Week, I remind you that Passover was kind of like Fourth of July for Americans. It is the national celebration of liberation and freedom from slavery in Egypt. Passover was always brought thousands and thousands of extra pilgrims to the city of Jerusalem. And in response to that, a special garrison from Rome was sent, headed by Pontius Pilate, to make sure that the people did not get out of control. In other words, they were peacekeepers. And we have heard that term used, right? And it was a military show of force. Now, what is interesting is that they would have come in, historians tell us, from the West. 
And so what you have is this peasant parade, this parable enacted theater coming from the east led by Jesus with the throngs of pilgrim uh, folks. And then from the west, this counter imperial power uh, parade led by Pontius Pilate. Um, now, when I say it's also orchestrated, I want to point out two texts without reading them to you. First Kings chapter one, and I read Zechariah to you this morning as a call to worship. Zechariah nine emerges out of the history of, Zech uh, of First Kings one. First Kings one is the anointing of the king of Israel, the son of David, a man by the name of Solomon. And that's the story there. And what's interesting about the story of the, of the anointing and of the lifting of Solomon as the king is that he is placed on a donkey. And he rides on a donkey uh, as the king. Now, that gave rise to the prophetic hope later in Israel's history that a new king would come, another son of David, and that this king, as I read in Zechariah, would liberate Jerusalem again and get rid of the forces of war. If you read Zechariah chapter 9, you will see that. And so this idea that is often shared with us that the riding of the donkey was simply an expression of humility on the part of Jesus is not fully accurate. It may be accurate, but it is not the full expression of the significance of Jesus choosing a donkey. Remember, it's orchestrated theater. He chooses it as an expression, both of the history of what it means to be king, but also in fulfillment of the prophetic hope that something significant is going to happen in the city of Jerusalem. Now, another key part of really understanding the gospel in this story, and, that, and, th and this is the point, guys, that is really important to me. Palm Sunday is an historic event. Like, I mean, we don't wanna just look at it and say, this is what happened on that day, and isn't that really cool? No, what we need to do is look at what the significance of what happened in this historic event and ask ourselves, where is the good news in this story? Where is the gospel in this story? And what does it mean now? Right? What does it mean now in the Twin Cities, in my life, in your life, in the life of our neighbors and our neighborhoods? Well, part of the gospel, one of the amazingly good news things in this story for me is that before Jesus gets to Jerusalem, he leaves from the town of Bethany. And it is in the town of Bethany, a small village, again, east of Jerusalem, that he is anointed. Now, you remember, Messiah means anointed. It's, the significant, it's profoundly significant. Well, what's the good news in the fact that he was anointed in Bethany? Well, there's two things, I think. And if we miss them, we miss the gospel. Because it is in the detail of these stories that the gospel is found. Number one, etymologically, I've looked up I remember reading it at one time. I re-looked it up this week to make sure my memory was correct. The significance about Bethany, well, there's, there's a lot. I mean, but it means the house of the afflicted or the house of the poor. Jesus was anointed in the house of the poor. He was not anointed in the ivory towers of the Jerusalem temple. And what's so gospel about this for me is that Jesus is the face of the true God. 
the incarnation of God. And if God is anointed in the house of the poor, that says something about the character and the nature of God. If he leads a theatrical parade of peasants from the east, from the place of the dawn, opposed to the empirical parade of military power coming in from the west, we are given a glimpse into the God that we worship. And if we miss that detail, we miss the good news. Bethany is the home of Simon and Mary and Martha. Simon, you remember, was healed of leprosy. Some believe that there was a colony in Bethany, that it was a place not only of the afflicted, but of the afflicted poor who had suffered the outcastness of being lepers. It's the place where Jesus reaches out and brings him back from the other side of the grave. You see, this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is Jesus' outpost. And the second thing that is so significant, who anoints Jesus in Bethany? Was it the official priesthood of the Jerusalem temple? Was it the royal court proclaiming him king? Or was it a woman whose testimony would not have been given credence in court of law by the name of Mary? And not only does she anoint him but she anoints him with everything she's got. She's all in. A year's wages worth of anointing materials, oils and perfumes. A year's wages of a laborer to express her love for Jesus. It asked me, what do I give as an expression of my love for the Lord? So you see, Palm Sunday is the beginning of Palm Sunday is this anointing in Bethany and this comparison between Solomon, the son of David who rides a donkey, who led his nation into a civil war by taxing his people to death, who built grand monuments and edifices to himself and compare Solomon with Jesus. And what the gospel is wanting us to see is that it is Jesus that is the true son of David, the true king, the godly king, the servant king, not the king who lords it down on his people but who serves from underneath. That's the gospel, brothers and sisters. We could go home right now, but there's a little bit more. And that's why uh, I just, just, that's why the picture of the bowl, the basin and the towel there. You've heard me say it and I'm, I don't ever get tired of saying it. The cross is the symbol of Christianity around the world. The cross is like an electric chair. It's like a noose hung in the Jim Crow South. The cross was an ex execution tool by the Roman Empire, and they crucified thousands on crosses. In my opinion, in my humble opinion, and I could be as far wrong as wrong can be, but in my mind, that should be the symbol of Christianity the bowl and the towel that will happen on Thursday night because that is the symbol of the humble one on the donkey. Foot washing, donkey riding king. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. All right, next slide. Hosanna, Hosanna, they cry. It's the people crying out. What are they crying? 
Hosanna means it's a desperate plea for help. So please, let's try in our imagination to put ourselves into a peaceful protest that is crying out for help. That's what Palm Sunday is. That's what Hosanna means. That's why on Sundays, part of what we call praise, pain, and protest, protest is the humble crying out for help. That's Hosanna. Now, there's another backstory here, another backdrop. It's not only Solomon. Um, it's not only Bethany. But in John's gospel, it talks about palm branches. It's the only gospel that mentions palm branches. And yet it's called Palm Sunday, isn't it? Now, in some traditions, by the way, just for you trivia folks, uh, often now it's called Passion Sunday. Um, but why is it called Palm Sunday? Because in John's gospel and John's gospel alone, the people cut palm branches and they wave it and lay it before Christ. Well, this is not the first time this has happened. And again, if this is orchestrated theater on the part of Jesus, and the gospel writers in John are the last writers after the disciples understand it, right? At first, they don't understand what's happening. But John makes it clear that later on, they did understand, and this is the last of the writings of the gospels, there is something that is to be understood. This is a passage from 1 Maccabees. It's a reference to the Maccabean revolt, which took place roughly 165 years or so before the birth of Christ. Simon entered Jerusalem with a chorus of praise and the waving of palm branches because a great enemy had been crushed. And I, I, I don't have time this morning to go into all the details, but what the Maccabean revolt was about was the desecration of the temple by the Greeks. And a priest and his sons led a revolt against the Greek empire and their enslavement of the people in Jerusalem, how they had taken over the holy city, the holy temple, desecrated it by worship to Zeus, the killing of pigs, and the destruction of some of the holy items in the temple. And Judas Maccabeus got his boys together and they led a guerrilla warfare attempt at recapturing Jerusalem and the cleansing and the rededication of the temple. It took years, guerrilla warfare. They do a little action in the city, they'd run to the hills. But eventually they won. And Judas Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem as a victor triumphant right and what's he do they cleanse the temple and they rededicate it as a legitimate place to worship god what does jesus do when he gets to jerusalem what is palm sunday ultimately about the cleansing and the rededication of a legitimate place that worships God, not what had been happening under the leadership of Herod and the, and the high priest ministry of Caiaphas. How could Pilate be responsible for building something that would be legitimately a place of worship for God? Come on, think. The same man who wants to slaughter children at Christmas helps build a place that truly honors and worships God? I don't think so. Caiaphas, a high priest who helps through his power to bend over the peasant class through taxation? It's another Simon, Solomon. Not Simon, Solomon. Do you understand what is at play in this story? This is a gospel story because this gives us they counter narrative. The ministry of Jesus is counter Pilate and those coming from the West, counter Herod and those that run the temple. Jesus 
when he gets there, you know what he does in the temple. He lets out the wrath of God. In 142, when Judas Maccabeus won the freedom of the city. And for roughly 100 years, there was peace and freedom in Jerusalem until about the year 63 when the Romans come in. And in the time of Jesus, it is the Romans who are the overlords. Now, did you remember when I read this morning out of John 12, and it said, and there were some Greeks there. Why would it say that? I mean, what's the big deal about that little detail in the story? Put your, head, put your helmet on now, put your thinking cap on. Why that detail? Yeah. Judas Maccabeus had to win the freedom from the Greeks. And now the Greeks are coming to worship. This is the gospel, right? That the kingdom of God includes people, all people. It's the gospel you see is in the details of these stories. Only in John's gospel, the palm branches. And this is a picture of a coin from the Maccabean era prior to Jesus. You can see that the coin minted had the palm branch. So nothing new here in Palm Sunday. It's, it's the retelling, the reenactment of a liberation movement. A liberation movement both from Rome, but just as, or perhaps even more so, a liberation of the place of worship. Now, the last slide is very brief. When we hear the word Hanukkah, our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrating Hanukkah, that is about Judas Maccabeus and the cleansing of the temple and the rededication of the temple. It's called the dedicate or the celebration of dedication, the celebration of lights. Just like little Simon, he was drawn to the light. Light, hope, not power, and not empire. This quote is gospel. Holy God, holy and powerful. Power without peer. You bend to us in weakness. Emptied, you draw near. And we behold your power, the Christ, the incarnated one, in the ministry and in the theater and in the orchestra of Jesus. God bless you in her Holy Week as we allow this alternative gospel into our lives. I hope to see some of you Thursday night, Friday night, We'll do our best to create an experience for you that is worshipful and meaningful. Thank you guys so much for being here this morning and for being at home. And again, grandma, granddad, grandma, granddad, thank you guys for making the journey here. I know it means everything to Josh and Carolyn. It's an honor and pleasure to have you with us this morning. Um, we will close our service now with the rising and singing of a sweet, sweet spirit. We invite you to sing, but with your mask on. And uh, henceforth, I will put my mask back on. God bless you guys.